be Andrew Houghton. He's uh, the managing editor of Scientific Data, which has been about, what, two years now? Four years. Four years. Four years, Four years. Four years. yeah. I know. Um, and it's about making data publication a, a first, um, first class research output. And this ties into all the stuff that we're talking about open research today and reproducibility of science. So it's a really good way to. To, to conclude our talks today. So thank you, Andy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me here and uh, for listening to my talk. And I'm sensitive to the fact that I'm now between you and lunch. And uh, I'm quite hungry and a little bit lightheaded. So if I go <laughs> off script, you know, um, I apologize for that. And I am mostly I'm going to talk about scientific data today. And it's really going to hit on some, I think, themes that you've already heard about today. But since this is the end of Open Access Week, I really want to take a second to, you know, emphasize how much open access has become the new norm and how much those of us who have fought for open access should, should, should take pride and pleasure in that. I mean, um, Springer Nature just in and of itself, so that's the publisher that publishes nature research and scientific data, we now have more than, more than 600 gold open access journals. And within the UK, more than 70% of our publications are you know, fully gold open access. And, and that's not just Springer Nature, right? There are other publishers that have seen this sort of, the same sort of dramatic transformation, um, and as well as, you know, the new publishers like PLOS that came onto the scene, um, well, some time ago now. I mean, but, it, it, you know, so open access is no longer this crazy idea. It really is the new norm. And um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about this journal, but yeah. So I think that's, it's, it's cool that we're here and to all the people that are on YouTube, um, I hope we all appreciate that at the end of Open Access Week. So I'm the managing editor of Scientific Data, and we've already heard about the importance of data sharing um, from um, several of our speakers today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, well, what's the role that data journals can play? And I'm specifically going to talk about how can we make data publication a first class research output and how we're trying to do that at scientific data. And I think this is actually um, going to build really nicely off of some of the questions um, at the very end of Nicola's presentation because PLOS has a very progressive data availability policy. Um, give them huge credit for that. But there was a recognition that you know, there's still very complex data sets that you know, it's hard for people to use unless they're really richly described and unless you have a peer review process that's really focused on making them usable. And so I think that that's a great way to lead into, well, what, how can uh, data journals help? So yeah, we've been up and running since May 2014, not, not quite four years yet. Um, <coughs> Regardless of what I say today, the easiest way to figure out you know, what we're actually about is to go to our journal and read some of our publications. You know, the researchers who publish at, at our journal are doing much more interesting stuff than I am. That's you know, just bottom line. Um, so the concept of the data paper, so you know, short and simple, it's a clear peer-reviewed description of data to maximize usage. And really, they're designed to make sure that researchers get credit um, for sharing their data in a reusable manner. And so we actually call our data papers data descriptors. Um, we are certainly not the only journal that, that, that is doing this. We have some great competitors, and there are other journals that have some sort of data paper or you know, data note to ZEP1000 um, article type. There's our URL again, if you want to visit us later. And so the journal is founded around um, five basic principles which are all designed to support this idea of sharing quality data. So researchers need to get credit for sharing their data, right? And they need to get credit for going that extra mile of actually making it reusable. So that means that our publications need to be indexed and fully citable. I want to make sure that a scientific data publication sits on your CV in the same way as any other research publication, right? Um, of course, this is Open Access Week. We are a fully open access journal. Um, all of our data descriptors are now published by, um, under a CC BY license. And each of our publications are supported by machine-readable metadata um, released under the CC0 waiver. So if any of you are metadata researchers and want to learn more about that, talk to me at lunch. Our articles focus on data reuse, right? This is not an opportunity for you to present your story or your interpretation. It's an opportunity to help other people use the data. And so that's an important distinction from traditional research articles. Um, but it, again, credit goes hand in hand with quality. Right? I mean, that, that's a key part of what science is about. And so each publication is rigorously peer reviewed 
um, in a manner that focuses on the technical quality of the data and its reusability. We are not a new data repository. This is a really important thing. We collaborate with community data repositories. Um, we, have, we actually list more than 90 of them now on our website. Uh, and we make sure that the data ends up in the right repositories. We had some earlier questions about how to find the right um, data repositories. And so I'll give some tips today, but feel free to talk to me afterwards because this is a huge part of what we do. So let me give you a, a brief introduction to what our data descriptors look like. And hopefully this will help you think a little bit about um, you know, how a data paper could serve you, whether it's at Scientific Data or some other journal. So the data descriptor has some elements that you're going to be familiar with. It has a title and an abstract. But we've also we've renamed um, the sections in a way that we think helps encourage authors to think about making their data reusable rather than just presenting their own interpretations. So we have a method section, of course. Um, our method section is of unlimited length. Um, so a typical data descriptor is going to be somewhere between 5 to 10 15 pages, but some of them really do get into that 20, 30,000 um, uh, word area as well. So, you know, they can be quite long. Um, we have then a data record section where you can provide a detailed description of what your data files actually are. What do the column headers um, actually mean? What's the format you're using? What, you know, where is it actually listed? And this is often what's missing from a lot of traditional research papers, even if the data files are, are provided. Um, and again, this is also unlimited length, so it's a much more room than you have in a traditional data availability statement. You then have a technical validation statement. This is where you provide whatever information you need for our peer reviewers to be convinced that your data is of quality. And this is really going to vary from field to field. If you're a genome sequencing person, for example, or an RNA sequencing person, this might be the gel showing that your DNA or, or, or RNA are, are, were of good integrity before they were you know, sequenced. Um, if it's social science, this might be the place where you're going to present some stati statistical analysis showing that your different personality raters were consistent in their ratings, right? So it's really going to vary from field to field. Um, some of these sections can be quite long. It's a little bit analogous to results, but it's not interpretive. Then the usage notes section is an optional section where you can give people tips on how to use the data. Maybe you want to recommend a particular normalization technique. Maybe you want to suggest software tools that they can use. And we, of course, we've got figures and tables and references. And then we have a separate data citation section. So this is really important. Um, this allows us to basically robustly link these publications to the actual data sets at the repositories that they're at. Um, and it gives formal credit to the data records and the authors. And the authors on the data records themselves might be different than the authors on the paper itself. It allows you to sort of micro-attribute. So I'm going to show you examples of two publications um, in a way that I think will give you some basic ideas of how people actually use data publications. So um, this is an example of um, a high throughput screening uh, data set that was published at Scientific Data um, back in 2014. Um, and so the authors um, conducted, this was a pooled um, screen for uh, genetic susceptibilities within cancer cell lines. And the original screen was conducted and then published in 2011 in PNAS. And at the time, this was an incredibly cutting edge technique. There was no repository out there that could handle this kind of data. And because the data was so unique, it was very hard to, you know, very hard for anyone else to use it. And certainly the authors were not opposed to sharing their data, but, you know, it had sort of been uh, available upon request kind of thing um, at the time. So when we launched in 2014, they said, you know, we'd really like to, to share the data in a more formal way. Um, and, and again, because the data are so unique, it, you need a very detailed description of the files and their format. Um, and so that's exactly what they did in this publication. Um, published it then with us. It went through a rigorous peer review process. They provided new figures that give sort of a deeper sort of technical look into the data and some of its variants. Um, and then, of course, we, we link these back to some of the previous publications that are actually using um, the data previously. And uh, the data we host at Figshare, which is a generalist repository, which will take pretty much anything, which is super good, right? Um, but also means that you really need the description to understand the data. And this data descriptor has now been cited more than 100 times. Of course, citation metrics, right, they have their caveats and their weaknesses. 
But my basic point here is that data publication, people will read it, they will cite it, and they will find value in it, even if there are other research papers already published. Right? So that's one case where people say, look, my data is so complex that it deserves a separate data publication. And we get these people doing it sometimes parallel. We do a lot of coordination side by side. But about, and this is about half of our authors are coming in with data sets that are linked in some way, shape, or form to other um, traditional research papers. The other half of our authors um, tend to be coming to us with a data set that has never been published before. Um, and this is a great example. So sometimes you generate an amazing data set, and you get authors that say this, and publishing it as a traditional story just doesn't make sense, right? You've generated something that's so unique. Step one is get it out to the community and start building collaborations around it. So this was a great example, so, um, and a really unique study. So um, they had um, volunteer graduate students in Germany, um, if I recall correctly, and they were placed in a high resolution brain imaging machine for um, an hour or so, and they listened to an audio version of Forrest Gump, the movie. <laughs> and they recorded their brain the whole time, right? So why would you do this? Well, partially because getting a television screen into these brain imaging machines is hard, um, but also because you know, that's a very complex brain stimulation, right? They're imagining three-dimensional environments, they're experiencing different emotions as the movie plays, and all within, you know, a, a synchronized process, right? You, you're synchronized to the movie. And so the, the authors basically said, look, not only is the re resolution here um, quite remarkable and cutting edge for the time, but it's, it's such a huge data set. We, we just don't know how to analyze it, and we don't think anyone does. So they kind of challenged it to the, um, released it to the community with a challenge. They actually set up on their website um, sort of a resource and a challenge where they encourage people to analyze the data. Uh, and um, it's now been cited um, 42 times or so, according to Google Scholar. The data are openly available. Um, and there's now been a number of publications, actually, where people have analyzed the data and found interesting correlations between you know, the content in the movie and what's going on in these people's brains. And these you know, novel findings, novel techniques in an area that is still just really, really at the very bleeding edge, I think, of, of neuroscience at the moment. And so the authors, you know, they built new collaborations out of that. They've released several new sort of layers of data on top of this but that they've published in other places. Um, so yeah, I mean, that great story. Sometimes you don't have to wait to make your story, right? You, you, sometimes you have data sets, you get them out there, and that helps you build your standing within your community. Um, again, so I said, you know, articles are kind of traditional. You can download a PDF and there's an HTML version and they've got links. But in addition to this, each article is supported by machine readable metadata in a format called Isatab. This is developed by some researchers at Oxford. This is an experimental aspect of the journal, but basically we're representing the experiment in a simple way in terms of what are the inputs to your experiment. Maybe these are tissue samples, maybe these are um, citations, if you're doing a literature review type thing that's generating an aggregated data set, and then what process did they go through using standardized machine readable terms, and then how does that relate to the final data files? Right? Um, and again, this is an experimental process. Um, you can download these as text files and we can help you get at them in a more um, automated fashion if you're interested. But what we find is that this process improves the data even further on top of peer review. It's not uncommon for us to find issues in the data during this process. And so if you're interested in this, you can explore this um, a bit more on our um, Is it Explorer. There's a link down here. So this is a graphical view of some of these metadata files. You can filter by the data repository. You can filter by technology type. And if you click on any of these, you get some automated visualizations of sort of the content of the study itself. So feel free to play around with that, ask me questions if you're into metadata. And so I, I want to um, come back to this acronym, which, which um, surprisingly hasn't, I don't think, been mentioned today, which is interesting because it's, it's all over these days. So sharing your data is good. Sharing it in a reusable fashion is better, but it's hard, right? And so that's what data journals are about, are about giving people credit for going that extra step. And so for you as a researcher, you know, how are you going to make your data usable to others? Well, a useful concept is this FAIR concept. 
um, which was not developed by us. This was developed by a group of people working with Force 11. They did publish a nice um, description of the concept at our journal. But basically, you want to make sure that your data are findable, right? Publishing a data paper is one way to make it findable, but not the only way. Good repositories also make things findable within their communities. That it's accessible, right? A paywall is obviously an obvious way that makes data less accessible, but you know, burying it in your backyard is obviously less accessible than having it openly on the web. It needs to be interoperable. Are your formats compliant with what other people in your field are using? And is it reusable, right? And so reusable means, is it partially, is there a good description of it, right? Um, because it, you can't reuse it if you don't understand it. But it also has to do with the licenses that are applied to it as well. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that's the purpose of, of our format. I want to talk a little bit then about how we interact in the time that I have remaining, how we interact with data repositories, and then how we conduct peer review. And um, I'm going to go a little bit faster just to say we have a list of data repositories, more than 90. Go to our website. If you're looking for a data repository, this is a great resource. We built this with a lot of advice from the community. It has influenced other lists at PLOS and elsewhere. Um, and so it's a big part of what we do. Uh, and um, we also support institutional repositories. We don't list them individually, but one of the repositories that does fit our standards is the University of Cambridge Data Repository, so plug for them. Um, you know, you, uh, learn about and use your institutional data repositories. We have a rigorous community-based editorial process. So acceptance is based, as I said, the technical rigor, the reuse value, and the completeness of the data description. And it is not based on the perceived impact or novelty of the findings associated with the data set. I mean, how could it be when half of our publications don't have any findings yet, right? So I think that's really key. So people ask us, oh, do you publish, you know, negative findings. It's like, well, I don't know. I publish quality data. Whether they're negative or positive is something for, for you know, later researchers to imprint that interpretation upon. We will not send it out for peer review unless our peer reviewers can see the data, period, um, in every case. So um, they have to, the links have to work, and then it has to be in a repository that we trust. And at the time of publication, authors must release the data under terms that permit wide reuse, essentially as open data, if you're familiar with the definition of that term. We do not permit um, restriction on commercial use because it is our belief that a big part of open science is about promoting commercial innovation. And a lot of research is itself commercial or commercially funded. Um, so last thing, obviously publishing a data paper is one way to get credit. Right? Because you know, now you've got a traditional literature product, and that's great. But we really think that you need to create a, a real culture of credit for data sharing, whether you're sharing it through a data journal or not. And we know that researchers want to know who is using their data. Right? This was a survey. This is published in Scientific Data. Basically asked, you know, what do you care about? Do you want to know how many people download your data? Do you want to know how many people are visiting the landing page? And they want to know which papers are, is it used in. Right? That's what people want to know, but repositories have a really hard time tracking this. So repositories track downloads, they track views, but down here, citations to individual data sets is hard. And that's because there isn't a culture yet of individual data citations. So this is something we're really encouraging. This is an example of a data citation at scientific data. Right? You're actually citing within the context um, of the text, a data citation, which links down to our data citation section, where you've got an identifier for the data set itself. So I, no matter what journal you're going to, you can do this in some shape, way, shape, or form. If you're using someone's data, cite their peer-reviewed publications and their data sets. Right? Talk to the journal. Ask if you can put it in the reference list. If they have a separate data citation section, great. Whatever, whatever that journal is, find a way to do it. Get those identifiers into your papers. And that helps create credit for data sharing. So if you remember nothing else um, from today, um, get the most from your data, preserve it, encourage reuse, get credit for it, and encourage others to do it. Do the same. So thank you very much um, for listening to me speak. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to take questions, and I hope we have some time before um, the food comes. And so that's my name, and these are some of the other people that work on the journal that I, is very important to acknowledge, and some of our partners. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, see what your experience has 
question regarding authors who are very unwilling to share their data. So um, we could basically set up on Belgian research, but more so because the crime of journey up on Belgian research on experience in medicine, like the Springer Nature, obviously. And that um, the, the community there is very much the clinical community. Yep. And we used to get a lot of pushback from yep. uh, the clinical research community. I'm I'm not talking about uh, anonymity issues, I'm talking about uh, credit and basically saying, well, I have worked so hard putting this data together. You know, I, we're the ones who put this trial together. Why yeah. should we now release this yeah. data? Do you face those sort of similar concerns, or is that reflected in the nature of the kind of papers that get submitted in scientific data? So we're confronted with this every day, although. And it's like, so I mean, the first two years when we were running as a journal, right? We, any journal, the first two years are a very early phase, right? You're not in the indexes yet. The people who are coming to the journal are all early adopters. So, you know, we never had, if you're coming to scientific data, you probably want to share your data. But nonetheless, we often have a, have a conversation with people, they're like, wait, 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 do you want anyone to be able to use my data? You know. Um, and so I think, um, and, and getting it so that peer reviewers can actually see the data, that was really uncommon. So in clinical medicine, now nature research has always had a basic standing that you have to be at least share your data upon request. Um, that has shortcomings, which I think we're all aware of, but clinical medicine has been one of the hardest because um, without being, look, there's really serious patient um, you know, ethical problems and patient privacy problems. Really serious, I don't want to diminish that at all. But the field has also, I think, a little bit been able to hide behind that. Um, and so data sharing is really, really uncommon. And I really think journals have to step up and say, look, if you're doing science, you need to be showing your evidence. Otherwise, maybe it's not science. So, and, and, but again, that, I'm, I'm the raving fanatic for data, data sharing, right? And I understand, clinical is hard. You've got to really like, you can't come in with that, right? You gotta talk to the people and you gotta talk. So we do that all the time. And just talking with the, you know, the clinical committees about how can I let the peer reviewers see the data without telling you the peer reviewers' names. So we will publish controlled access data sets, um, human data sets, and it's hard. And I, sometimes I estimate it takes about 10% of my time. And, and it's a very, very small percentage of our publication. So that's an unsolved problem. Um, and uh, yeah, so, but yeah, I mean, I think, Journals that are requiring data sharing across the board, great. The, uh, the Nature journals have constantly, um, you know, their, their, their policies are different, but very similar actually in the way that they're implemented because all of the editors do encourage data sharing across the board, so. Because we, for us it's mandatory as well, so yeah. there are times where we have to reject a, a paper yeah. basically because they can't share yeah. the data without a good reason. Yeah. Um, so I was just interested to see what your yeah. experience yeah. was. Yeah, and so this is sort of publishers talking to publishers here. So a bit of advice um, to the YouTubers and to the other researchers in the field. A lot of publishers have a minimum share upon request requirement, right? Um, so if you don't get the, see the data that you want, write to the author. If you don't get it, write to the editor. Most good journals or publishers will take action. And I don't think there's enough of that happening. Like we have people who are just complaining all over Twitter, no one's ever sharing the data. It's like, sit down and request some of it first. Sit down and you know, um, get, that, get that conversation started with your community. And if people are constantly getting you know, an email saying, oh, another data request, people are gonna say, well, maybe it would have been easier if I just put it on the web in the first place. <laughs> so, yeah. does something really bad, and not by bad, they don't mean, you know, crap science, they mean build a bomb or something based on, on the work that I've made available, then who's ultimately responsible? And if I can't track who's, who's downloaded it, then there's no way of kind of pointing to that, which is a different reason again. For yeah. This is really common in physical science, and, and I, I, it kind of baffles me because it's such a technical community. It's usually voiced as, well, people don't, won't be able to understand my data properly, so they're going to put up bad analyses, right? And so I'm from the computational biology field where we've been releasing sequencing data forever. And you're just, we're just used to the fact that people, you know, you have to put it out there in the open. And yeah, some analyses are gonna be more competent than others, right? This was not so much that other people might just <coughs> do a rubbish job of it. Yeah. It was more that the, the, the 
work that you've done in good faith for one purpose might be repurposed for evil. Right. And then who's to blame? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I yeah. Usually, when I have these conversations with people, I feel that their concerns are overblown, and it, it's it's a sense of control. Mm -hmm. And and that look, let's not like researchers pour their hearts into their research, right? And the desire to have um, sort of a parent role for your data is, is totally natural. And so it's our job to say, well, how, how can you, you know, it is okay to release your data. You will get credit for it. But there are cases where there are legitimate dual use concerns, right? Um, legitimate dual use concerns. Well, and in those cases, just like with sensitive human data, you need to talk about how can we share it in a way that protects, you know, what are your actual concerns? How do we protect against it? Fantastic. Yeah. All right.